At Daily K sacks 12,000 workers, dethrones three monarchs and promises to probe alleged looting by the immediate past administration as he takes office as the sixth executive governor of Oshun State. And Northern Christians endorse Peter Obi says Babachia Lawa. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anakon. Oshun State Governor Senator Ademola Adeleke has sacked 12,000 workers and ordered the dethronement of three monarchs barely 24 hours after his inauguration. The governor also nullified the appointment of 30 permanent secretaries and suspended the chairman and members of Oshun State Independent Electoral Commission. A statement by the Chief Press Secretary to Adeleke Olawale Rashid on Monday stated that the new governor signed the executive orders which covered chieftain team matters, appointment issues, setting up for of the new review panel staff audit and employment matters. The governor has also directed that all bank accounts belonging to the state government should be frozen with immediate effect, claiming that the immediate past administration had looted some of the assets of the state and vowed to probe the alleged looting. Mr. Adelike was sworn in as the sixth civilian governor of Oshun State on Sunday in the presence of thousands of people of the state at the Oshobo Township Stadium. Well, joining us to discuss and break this down is Olushala Eleka, his former deputy governor of Ikiti State, and Ayo Ologun, a spokesperson, Transparency and Accountability Group. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with you, uh, of course, um, Mr. Leka, because you have obviously been a former deputy governor uh, of the state, uh, of Ekiti State, I beg your pardon, and you're a member of the People's Democratic Party. And I'm guessing that this was not just a win for members of the People's Democratic Party, but uh, um, also a win for Shun State. But um, many have queried, you know, the first um, dissolution of, of course, appointment of permanent secretaries and secondly, um, of the throning of three monarchs uh, in the state as some of the first things that would be uh, accounted to uh, Governor Adeleke. Uh, care to explain to us why the governor took this position? Well, uh, first you begin to wonder what the immediate past governor had been thinking of or what he had been having in, up in his mind. Uh, for him to delay the appointment of 30 permanent secretaries uh, to the last uh, minute of his administration. Uh, I believe this is just a way of setting up uh, bottlenecks for the incoming administration. It is not proper. You are talking of people that will actually uh, uh, come around and be in place to work with the new governor. And uh, I believe the governor also uh, if he's going to work with entirely 30 new permanent secretaries, he needs to be able to have to be given that opportunity and privilege of being able to assess uh, the competence and the uh, capacity of the people that will be appointed. Appointing 30 permanent secretaries for him without his input is, is, uh, is a, a little bit awkward. And I believe the new governor has done the right thing. Huh. I'm going to go to Mr. Ologun in a bit, but the governor has said, uh, some of the, one of the last things he said yesterday um, was the fact that he reduced debt in the state and he left behind 14 billion naira. Even though um, Governor Adeliki has frozen accounts, also saying, uh, in fact, he has alleged that there has been some form of uh, financial corruption under the Uyetala government. Um, you obviously have been watching from the sidelines. What would you say about um, when it comes to prudence in, in spending under the Uyetala government? Before I go to Mr. Logo. Mr. Leka, can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Leka, can you hear me? I think that we lost that connection. Yeah. Can you hear okay, me now? I can hear you now. Okay, yes, great. Yes, I can hear you now. So I was asking, um, now that uh, Governor Yetola has said that he reduced 
debt in Oshun State, and he has also um, left behind 14 billion naira. I just said that the governor, the incoming governor, has frozen all the government accounts, alleging uh, some form of financial misappropriation. Um, what do you think would have cost the gov governor to allege this? Again, being that the go this is what Governor Yetela is saying, he has reduced debt and he left 14 billion naira. What could have possibly made the incoming governor freeze but, these accounts? Well, that, that, that is the, the, the former governor has made the, I mean, made the statement which the new governor uh, has not been has not really had the opportunity of ascertaining the authenticity of that statement. Uh, anybody can come up and said he, he, uh, he had left 14 billion naira in the coffers of the government, and I believe the the new governor has done the right thing by first of all freezing all government accounts to ensure that uh, uh, corrupt acts uh, are prevented in terms of. Uh, some people using the opportunity of the last minute and exit of the previous government, I mean, governor, the past governor, to defraud the state government. So freezing all the accounts, I think, is in order. And this to enable the new governor to do to ascertain exactly what is in place. Uh, it is when he gets there and he sees things for himself. That's when he will be able to ascertain whether actually 14 billion naira has been left in cash uh, in the coffers of the government. And I believe he has done the right thing. That, I mean, is going to be held accountable now that is governor. Hmm. Uh, to you, Mr. Logan, let's talk about the stay of Governor Yetala and, of course, the fact that he lost uh, um, as a sitting governor uh, this particular election. We saw um, that he wasn't very quick to um, congratulate his opponent. He um, had said that they were going to study the results of the election that led to Adeleke's um, um, win. I'd like to hear from you what how what your assessment of governor yetela's government has been so far mr logo can you hear me oh, all right can I hear you. thank you very much i'm talking about the assessment of governor yetela's administration in the last four years there are basic things that he has been able to do that you cannot take away from him except otherwise are made public by the new administration you will recall that at the time the governor of the administration took over the administration, the state was almost going insolvent. It was a period in time when the government of Washington State, under the leadership of Ralph Arabeshola, could hardly pay um, salaries of civil servants. And when the came in, he refused that um, uh, process, started paying salaries of workers and not just paying it in full. So, look, are you there? Can you still hear us? Can you hear me? I think we have lost that connection with you. Um, hopefully, we can get you back to give us more. But back to you, Mr. Leka. Let's talk about the fact that um, the World Bank had named Oyetola back in the day as uh, the best governor in efficiency and public expenditure. And just like um, Mr. Logan was trying to give us some background, um, he seemed to... We are paying it to time. We were paying it to not take away from... Um, we lost you for a second, Mr. Logan, but welcome back. Go ahead. As part of the source of history, as a governor who did Apparently, we're having trouble with uh, Logan's line there, so I uh, will stay with Mr. Leka. Mr. Leka, let's talk about the inaugural speech of the Oshun State newly inaugurated governor. I want to look at his developmental agenda. It's very important to me because, of course, these are, these are what we will be holding or the people of Oshun will be holding him to uh, in time to come. Uh, he talked about, you know, the welfare of workers and pensioners. He talked about boosting the state's economy. Uh, he also made reference to homegrown infrastructure policy and, of course, et cetera, et cetera. But let's talk about the welfare of workers and pensioners. Recently, I had a group of pensioners on... Um, a radio show talking about how badly treated they have been uh, from the government and um, how most of them have died and most of them have suffered penury as a fact as a result of the fact that government have abandoned them what exactly will governor um, Adelike be doing differently and he's talked about boosting the state's economy what's the mainstay in the state and why have they not necessarily taken advantage of it and do we see the Adelike government doing this. Again, I'd like to add quickly, many people have made fun of the senator saying that he's mostly a dancing senator. 
Uh, most people see him as a fun guy as opposed to a man who would be able to hold that office and bring all his promises to pass. Uh, what could you tell the average person differently? Well, uh, don't forget that the, the issue of uh, uh, outstanding pensions and uh, outstanding salaries and half salaries or maybe a quarter of salaries that have, been, that have not been paid in the past uh, is still there, it's still intact. Uh, the middle past government of uh, Oshu State did not actually uh, settle the outstanding uh, salaries or outstanding pensions. I think it started right from its own administration and left the ones uh, left of paid during the Arab uh, administration there. Uh, the new governor has come in, it's a new sheriff in town, and I believe he understands the problems on Grant and is one man that can be trusted, irrespective of whatever anybody says, right? Uh, he has said it in his speech, and we hold him by his word, that he, he is uh, very much at home to address uh, these pertinent issues of uh, pension, palaver, and uh, outstanding salaries. And I believe he's going to start from somewhere uh, to uh, see what he can do to ensure that uh, the pensioners are giving a leeway out of their present suffering. Uh, as regards uh, the issue of him being a dancing senator, well, you see, when you take a look at him, right, he's not a pretender. He is himself, right? And the fact that he loves to make himself happy does not mean that he doesn't have uh, substance upstairs. Don't forget, he's a graduate of criminal uh, justice and uh, with a bias in political science as a graduate. And I believe he has the competence and the skills uh, required to be able to govern uh, Oshun State. And don't forget also that he has been a senator. So I believe he had acquired all necessary experience and uh, he had the required capacity to be able to govern Oshun State, uh, irrespective of whether he likes to make people happy or to make himself happy. And I think that is good for him. I'm most curious about these very interesting development agenda that he has placed before us and the Oshun people. Um, industrialization, wealth and you know, job creation, um, people focused policy on education, affordable health care, security and social welfare. It seems to me like the normal thing that any politician would, you know, bring as either his blueprint or his mandate, but then um, what Nigerians are now most in, in, interested in is the how-to. Because, of, of course, we know that he's already inherited a problem of civil servants who have been promoted before he even came into office. He's also ha having to deal with an INEC, or rather um, uh, a state independent electoral commission, where he has had to sack some of the bosses. He has his job mostly cut out for him. Where do you think that, if you were to be uh, one on the advisory board, to the governor, where would you think that he'd rather start from? And what do you think the people of Oshun State need most importantly right now? And where should the governor be starting from? Well, don't forget that there are lots of problems already on ground. And uh, definitely, uh, there's no way he can solve all the problems at a go. He has to start from somewhere. And uh, having a manifesto or his plan, these are plans, right? And it has to be taking the plans one after the other to be able to uh, effect the implementation. Uh, but I believe that uh, there are two key areas which I believe to uh, focus on immediately, uh, uh, apart from ensuring that uh, the, the welfare of the workers are taken into proper consideration. Uh, one is the education, uh, the state of education in Oshu State. Uh, if you look at the rating of Oshu State today, it's almost uh, at the very low end uh, of, of that rating uh, scale. And uh, I believe that a lot of things have to be done when it comes to uh, uh, in-service training for teachers, both in primary and secondary school. First of all, let him take a look at uh, the staff strength, uh, the staff-student ratio, and whether there is need for employment or not. Uh, and also to employ the right set of people if there is a need for that. Uh, not only that, 
Uh, there is a need for continuous professional training of teachers. This is one thing that is missing in most governments. Teachers are there, left, they are being left untrained for, for years. You can't do that in professions like accountancy or engineering. We are every year they're expected to participate in some sort of continuous professional development. Mm -hmm. uh, these are usually, I mean, this type of training, this type of development uh, have been found to be absent within the teaching profession. And I think that's an area where uh, there, there is a, it really needs to come in and, uh, and, and do a lot. Because if you have under-trained teachers, then you don't expect excellence from the students uh, they, they, they are teaching. Uh, so in, in this area, uh, apart from also including providing an enabling environment in terms of facilities, uh, which I believe uh, is not too bad in Oshun State, uh, presently, however, uh, ensuring that the teachers are properly trained on the job, mm -hmm. issues of in-service training is very Okay, let's talk about let's talk about the mainstay. I, I think we're having a connection issue yet with you, Mr. Lekka. I'll try again. Let's talk about the mainstay of Oshun State now. Also looking at the um, internal generated revenue from the state and how much um, the federal government gives to Oshun State from its coffers. Um, if if the state government were to look into, um, you know, its minerals, its solid minerals, and of course the natural, what nature has given to it. Um, do you think that the government, successive governments, not just the Uyutala government, have done enough in terms of looking within to see how much they can do in terms of um, what nature has given to the state? And again, um, what are the other things that need to be done in terms of infrastructural development? Because it looks like um, uh, all I have seen is just roads. And, and this seems to be not just you know, the same thing around the southwest, we've seen it in the south south, we've seen it everywhere. Politicians basically just build new roads and, and call it infrastructural development. Should we not be going beyond that? The issue of underutilization of uh, uh, the natural deposits in various states is not peculiar to Oshun State alone. And I think it's a general problem that our state governments actually need to address. Uh, in partnership with the federal government. Uh, that aside, uh, I think Osho State, under the new administration, should focus more on agro-based industrialization. And uh, if, if this can be done, and I think that is a good way to start uh, developing industries that derive most of its uh, inputs from agriculture. Uh, is, is one good way by which uh, the new government can start. And in terms of roads, yes, uh, road, road construction, road infrastructures are very important. But this time around, it, we, we need to consider roads even leading to farms, farm areas, uh, uh, leading to rural areas where most of these agricultural products are, are, are being produced. Uh, unfortunately, most of the roads leading to farm areas are so bad that even to bring the products out to the urban centers, to uh, to rural urban markets becomes very difficult and it costs a lot. So uh, there's not too bad in road construction, but then it should, it, there should be targeted. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, let me, I think we have uh, Mr. Logo back. So Mr. Logo, I'm going to go back to my question earlier on because I was trying to ask you uh, about the legacy of the Uyetala government and what he will be remembered for. Now, um, he has said that he will soon be back as governor of the state, um, that he's only stepping aside as a law-abiding citizen. Um, he's also criticizing, you know, the elections that brought about the sitting governor right now, and he's saying that um, the matter is being still challenged in court. Care to explain to us what you think the government, the governor, the former governor meant? Of course, the, what the governor, the former governor meant by saying that he's simply stepping aside is that by the provision of the law, an election has held, and the high, uh, the high man that is responsible for that election has declared the winner in that election, which makes it a compulsory duty that the newly elected governor should be sworn. 
But then you will recall that um, the immediate past governor has gone to court to challenge the outcome of that election. Uh, the case is at the tribunal presently and is undergoing trials. So which means whatever the outcome of the legal process is, if eventually the, 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 the tribunal subsequently moving on to the appeal finds the election unduly on, on in favor of um, Governor Dumala Adeleke, that means the governor will come back. And if the court otherwise feels that the election is, is due and, and, and is binding on, on the citizens of the state, that means Governor Adeleke will continue for his first four-year term in office. But by and large, whatever the outcome of the of the court will be is what we await in the first case at the tribunal, subsequently uh, moving on to the appeal court and every other layers of, of justice that is required in um, post-election activities. Um. I remember when the sitting governor, now the new coming, uh, incoming governor, um, won the, or was announced as winner of that election. Uh, governor Oyetala at the time did not necessarily uh, congratulate him. Um, and many criticized that saying, even if he did, um, you know, have intentions of challenging the results, what she, the, the honorable thing should have been to congratulate. Uh, Mr. Deleke. Now, well, I'm, I'm going somewhere here. Um, in terms of liaising with the, incom uh, the incoming government and, you know, letting them know their way around in uh, the government house, how do you think that relationship has gone so far? Ha has there been an open door and a friendly uh, gesture in that regard? Well, the process leading to the swearing in of the new governor yesterday wasn't a friendly one. Um, like a lot of people have opined, one would have expected that the immediate past administration would have put in place um, a transition committee that would have worked hand in hand with the transition committee set up by the new governor, Governor Demala Adeleke. But that didn't happen. The governor Adeleke set up his own transition committee and the immediate past administration failed to put up its own transition committee. What we had, according to the news report, is that the had gone administration I required the chief of staff to be in, to be the liaison officer between the outgoing government and the new government, and that in itself has been a judge not to be good enough. It should have been a synergy, a seamless transition. But that is in the dustbin of history now. Whether a transition committee was put in place or not, a new government has been sworn in, and it is expected that whatever actions and inactions of the past administration would be reviewed if necessary, and whatever action the new governor will be taking should be such that would be legal. I should not sacrifice political correctness on the altar of legality. That will be an undoing for him. Mm. I'm wondering to you, because you obviously are a civil society. Um, this is not the first time we're seeing this happen. We see this happen time and time again, especially if an opposition is taking over from the incumbent. We've seen this in River State when Governor Wike was taking over uh, from, from former Governor Rotimi Amechi. There was not a cordial transition of sort. And this has also happened in several other places, which you can actually agree with me. But why do we keep seeing these actions? And what exactly do our politicians need to understand about winning and losing? We, we need to understand that the reason why we often see this happen between a good administration and incoming one is because as a nation, as a state, and as a people, we fail to do what is needed. I've always been an advocate of the fact that there needs to be a transitional law in the nation. There also needs to be a transitional law in all the states of the Federation. There should be a, a law in place that guides the process of transition in such a way that whoever is handing over to an incoming whether whether the same party or an opposition party, knows its limits. He knows what he can do within the time of election and the time it will be handed over. Even if you are even if you are succeeding yourself, the transition law should be made in such a way that there will be limits to the possibility of what step and action an outgoing governor can take so that it does not create undue or uh, undue milestone for the incoming administration. We have such law existing in Kenya, we have it existing in a number of other countries. I think a Kitty State government has led um, the, the pack in the country by putting a transitional law in place, but this becomes necessary so that we don't continue to have this kind of kind of crisis in virtually of the state of the federal. Federation and even at the federal level, when we are transiting from one administration to another, whether within the same political party or otherwise. So I'm saying that, look, for us to avoid this kind of situation going forward, there is a need to put in place a transitional law that will guide the process of a seamless transition between an outgoing administration and the other. And all politicians should know that power is transient. Whatever you want to do, the maximum limit of time you have is eight years. 
So whatever you do should not be about political correctness. It has to be about the interest of the people. Because by and large, like, like they say, soldier go, soldier come, the barrack remains. You people will go in and out of the government house or out of the governor's office, but the state remains uh, as one. So whatever action and inaction anybody wants to take as an outgoing governor as an incoming one, they should put it at the back of their mind that they have only been privileged to be elected to serve the people. And the interest of the people should be sacrosanct and not the interest of their political party or their self-aggrandizement. Let me ask you a final question before I go back to Mr. Lekka. Um, do you have any concerns about the incoming government? I mean, just like I asked Mr. Lekka, who's a member of the PDP, um, many have really um, criticized uh, the senator, um, saying that he is more of a fun guy. They do not take him seriously. Um, even though um, the Ashram people seem to have necessarily taken him seriously, and that's why they voted for him en masse. But do you have any concerns? And and um, what do you hope to see uh, from the Adiliki administration, especially uh, his first 100 days in office? The, the, the choice of um, Governor Demola Adiliki to dance is, 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 is about his person. You will also recall that when we had Raul Farag Bechola in this state as the governor, he was given to singing. He was given to a lot of song when he goes to campaign, grants, and all of that. So it is not an issue for me if he exercise his innate being of enjoying the moment dancing. But that's not the point. The point really would be what are the things that it needs to do, like you asked in the next 100 days. I have a lot of concern about a lot of action that he has taken between yesterday and today for that are, for me, more of political correctness than legality. You, you will recall that a, a, a number of hours ago, the House of Assembly issued a statement where they said that, look, whatever action has been taken by the promulgation of the law of an House of Assembly or by the court can only be refused by the court or by the House of Assembly. And that is one lesson that the uh, present admission of uh, Governor Demel Adelike needs to learn. You don't just go around making executive orders simply because you now have power in your hand. No. People around them should be able to advise him in making sure that whatever decision is being taken is in tandem with the law. We should not sacrifice legality on the altar of political correctness. And this is my fear that um, he, he, he has not been properly advised in some of the decisions he has taken. You can call for review of actions and inactions of the governor before you. But that is not to throw away every decision taken between July 16, I mean, July 17, and yesterday that was warning. Forgetting the fact that the Middle Pass administration subsisted until the 26th of November. So whatever decision was were taken between July 17 when he was elected and 26th, I mean, and yesterday when he was sworn in as governor, those actions can only be refuted in the eyes of the law okay. and not just making blanket executive orders and throwing them into the dustbin. Right. There is no reason to sacrifice legality on the altar of political I correctness. Hear I hear you. Finally, Mr. Lekker, because we're out of time. Um, can you say that Governor Adimola Adeleke is a unifier? We know that you know there are people who are divided uh, on you know the results and who emerged, and and of course with all of the sackings and the reversals, there are going to be a lot of frayed nerves. Do we see him being a unifier as opposed to being sentimental about what's happening right now? Well. Uh if you take a look at what he has done, I don't think they has reversed all decisions taken between uh, 17th of uh, uh, July and November 26th uh, by the immediate past administration. Uh, while I agree with Mr. Yologun on his submission, uh, some of the things that he, he said, uh, he has actually said that he's going to set up some committees, some panels to investigate the actions and inactions of the previous government and then see whatever needs to be corrected. Uh, and I think that is still in order. Uh, Governor Adeleke has uh, exemplified the unifier nature, even when he was uh, being shows, uh, elected as the governorship candidate. Uh, he, he was able to bring all the various factions together and the different interests were able to come together and work together as a team. And that is what you, you could see that in the in the victory uh, okay. uh, in this election okay. uh, in the governorship election. So okay. I, I believe I, I believe he has that trait of unifiers. Okay, all right. Well, I want to say thank you uh, very much, gentlemen, because we're out of time. Olushala Leka is former deputy governor of Ekiti State and Ayo Ologun, spokesperson for Transparency and Accountability Group. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation.
Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we will be talking about the, this, uh, the Baba Chair Lawal position and, of course, what the Northern Christians are saying and who they intend to support come 2023. Stay with us.